want to have some way of saying, well, this this is a test and this is a test and this is a test. They're, they're separate based on that rule. Okay, so with that rule in place, and then this one is pretty typical of the one shown here, you then define a whole sequence of event or event condition combinations that uh, leads you to a allowed test ending state. And we're going to want to capture at the very least the expected action as the expected result for each transition. If it is possible to directly or indirectly observe the state that the application is in, then that would also be part of your expected result. Now, to keep track of what you've covered, it's very simple. If you've got a printout of the diagram, you simply mark off the states and the transitions as you go. So using a highlighter or a marker or something like that, just as I showed in the previous slide, as I was going along, I was using a yellow marker to mark things off. That's a, a pretty good way to do that. And then you repeat steps two and three over and over again until every state's been visited and all transitions have been traversed, and then you know that you've achieved that. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. Say that the uh, test must start in the initial state and must end if it enters the final state. So to generate the first test, uh, we start off browsing. We click a link, display, add to cart, selection dialog, and so forth. You see walking through the entire um, uh, diagram here, state transition diagram. And notice that I'm looping where I can, right? So I've got the login bad, login good, purchase bad, purchase good. Those are, are uh, shown here. Um, now, what that will do if you take take any loop that you can as you work through and derive the tests, you'll tend to minimize the number of tests that you create and maximize the number of events that occur in a single test. Um, now, that's that's fine if you if you feel that the system is relatively stable. If you think that the system is has a lot of bugs in it and you want to have very fine grained tests that test a few things together, then you would actually say, well, I, I don't want to do these these loops. I want to actually have, for example, a separate test for the um, login bad and purchase bad, okay, each of those a separate test because I want to know if those aren't handled properly that there's a, the proper uh, error handling occurs, right? So um, that's another thing. It's, it's a judgment call for the tester. You just have to decide. Do you want big, coarse grain tests or do you want small, fine grain tests? And it's usually about traceability of the test results back to a limited set of conditions. Okay, so after this first test is run, you see the coverage check here. Uh, notice that the uh, things which have been covered, the transitions and the states, are shown with dotted lines. The um, guys here, the abandons, as you can see are not covered and neither is the, um, the go elsewhere. So we've got to do a little more work. Okay. So deriving the rest of the test, here's the first test again just for reference. And now I'm going to abandon from the selection dialog, test three abandons from the login dialog, and test four is going to abandon from the purchase dialog, and then finally test five, rather than going back and browsing, um, again, is going to uh, uh, do the go elsewhere after the confirmation. Okay. And based on those additional four tests, I've now achieved complete coverage. You see these are all, all shown with dotted lines now. I have to kind of squint at that back there, but see that they're lighter. Color. And if you've got really good eyes, I use do but don't anymore, um, you can actually see that there's a different color coding to these lines that shows the traceability back to the specific test. If you want to have traceability back 
to the specific test numbers for whatever reason, you could always write the test number on the transition or the state just so that you keep track of this is where it's covered. Though usually that's not going to be necessary. It's, it's more that, you know, satisfy yourself that you have covered it, not that you're, you know, which test covers it. Okay, now, <clears throat> it's a good idea to try to keep these diagrams simple. Now, you can't always keep them so simple that they'll fit on a single PowerPoint slide. Obviously, I had to do that for this example, but uh, you don't want them to, to be enormous and complicated. But of course, systems in the real world are enormous and complicated, right? So what do we do when we have a very complex system? Well, usually what you try to do is encapsulate um, some complicated actions as, or sequences of, of events and actions, excuse me, as a uh, superstate. okay? So the example here in this particular diagram is the purchasing state is actually a super state. Um, the purchasing, as, as those of you who use e-commerce systems will know, consists of a, uh, a sequence of screens that you go through, not just one screen. Um, so we can... Uh, we can expand out the superstate of purchasing into three substates, as shown here. Um, this is based on a fairly typical e-commerce system. Uh, we have the first uh, screen that comes up, which is the entering address, and then we have the uh, specifying payment mode, and then finally the editing of the order, if desired. And uh, notice that uh, the inbound events the inbound transition, excuse me, here is the same. And the outbound is the same. So this whole thing inside this dashed box here is nicely encapsulated. See that? Nice, nicely encapsulated within this, which is what you want. You want the inbound and the outbound uh, transitions to be the same as what were uh, shown for the superstate. Uh, and then uh, the changes are all internal within here. So you create the tests for the um, higher level diagram first, and then you expand out the superstate into the substates, and then you either expand the existing tests to take into account the uh, substates or generate some new tests to cover the substates. But the rule then would be the same, that every state needs to be visited and every transition traversed. Okay. And this is, of, um, there's an arbitrary number of, of iterations that you can go through here, right? So there's no limit on how deep this can go. In, in each of these cases, the substates could also decompose down into a further set of substates. And, you know, for complicated applications, this might actually go fairly deep. Okay, so this allows you to deal with complex uh, systems without necessarily having a state transition diagram that spans you know, four whiteboards, right? Now you still might cover four whiteboards, but with nicely partitioned ones that are, you know, comprehensible each to itself. Okay, now tables, state transition tables. And the nice thing about the diagrams is that the diagrams show you in a nice graphical way what events can occur and how the system is supposed to handle those, both in terms of the action that it takes and the state that it ends up in. So that's nice, and it gives you a good visualization of what's supposed to go on. The thing that a state transition diagram really can't do for you is tell you what happens if an unexpected event or event condition combination occurs. What the diagram shows you is only that which is defined. It doesn't show you the error handling, if you will. Okay, well, errors can handle, and it can happen, right? And they have to be handled. So think of uh, a lot of browser-based applications, for example,